So uh, today is uh, with considerable regrets, uh, but um, also with uh, appreciation for the turn of events, um, for the final day of class. Uh, and I wanted to use today to go over a set of kind of forward-looking materials for this class. Um, and I want to do so in two broad areas. We're going to have to watch the time uh, carefully because each of them are deep, substantive, uh, and worthy of a lot of commentary and a lot of examples. But time is not on our side, so we're going to have to keep the, the, the commentary brief. The two broad areas are, on the one hand, hybrid modeling and hybridization, particularly of different system science methodologies, things like combining system dynamics with agent-based modeling or agent-based modeling with discrete event simulation or all three, et cetera. A very important uh, asset in the, uh, the toolbox of modelers and in our ability to investigate systems as we learn. Beyond that, though, I wanted to talk about a different sort of hybridization and a different sort of contrast. And, and that has to do between, include placing system science um, in the broader context of, of contemporary data science and really talking about a synergy between the two that with rather little imagination, I term systems data science. But uh, something that offers really a whole greater than some of the parts where, where the two are combined and joined at the hip and are synergistic. And uh, the tools that we'll talk about there leverage the sort of system science techniques we've been speaking about, but in a, in a data rich context in and in a, in a way that allows us to better understand systems in the world through a data-driven methodology, but also to through the lens of system science to get unique understanding of certain features of those system that say traditional machine learning approaches uh, left alone won't give. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to talk each uh, talk about each of these and then we have a couple of minutes at the end and sort of talk about um, you know learning options going forward for anyone who's interested in going a bit deeper. So that's uh, a big ask for today, um, but one that's uh, uh, the one that's I think worthy for this uh, final session of the class. Okay, um, and uh, I'm going to jump into it, and uh, we'll see how far we can get in each of these uh, quite quite big topics. So I have posted two sets of slides. Um, to this end uh, on the course site. I've also posted a number of models that we'll be making use of uh, within the context of this, this first lecture, okay? Um, th this first set of slides has to do with hybrid modeling. And I'd like to make it fairly interactive. So I'd, I'd invite you to, to fire up your, your any logics here so that we can uh, we can actually go and open some models. Uh, and what we're going to do is take a look at a handful of different patterns for using different system science techniques together. And we'll be walking through a number of examples, some of which you've seen before, some of which uh, I just posted today and which we'll very likely be new to you for that reason. Okay, so switching back over to the slides here, I'm going to uh, make a few remarks and then we'll start opening models. But if you get your your any logics up, you'll be uh, in in good shape here. So I'd like to to open these comments with uh, an observation that. Fittingly enough, system science techniques and the value they deliver are not merely 
an additive phenomenon. So it's not merely a matter of, you know, you have a choice of this method or that method or that method. It turns out that, that the methods are highly complementary and it turns out highly synergistic. So there's a whole greater than the sum of the parts between them. Um, but different methodologies, th this whole greater than the sum of the parts reflects the fact that different methodologies not only use different formalisms, different ways of describing a dynamical system, they typically are leveraged to ask different types of questions. Discrete event simulation, for example, asking questions about how the availability of resources will impact the throughput of a system, how many people say could be treated per day, or affecting how long, how long the line is for, for treatment, where placement of resources would most help. System dynamics, often focusing on, on shifting mental models with simple models and focusing on understanding feedback rich systems with accumulation. And agent based modeling, focusing a lot of its attention on situated agents in context, interacting with each other in the environment. And no one system science methodology offers a completely satisfactory replacement for the other. I want to be clear here, from a computational standpoint, from a computer science standpoint, if you take in, say, 432 or, or some of the courses that, that deal with machines and automata, um, it's actually not 432, it's, uh, it's a different one, but um, uh, you'll, you'll know that there's a notion of computational universality. Does anyone, does anyone know, know the notion of computational universality? Okay, so there's a there's a notion of computation that's universal in the sense that any other any algorithm can be, can be executed on it, and uh, we can have different representations of it in the form of a smartphone, in the form of this laptop, in the form of a tinker toy computer, in the form of a cellular plummet in the game of life. And all of them could in fact simulate the others. All of them could in fact run an emulator for the others that would kind of simulate the, the, the other systems. Uh, on. And so they're all equally powerful in what they can allow us to, to execute in terms of the set of algorithms. This is in contrast to Simpler formalisms like finite state automata or push down automata uh, associated with things like context free grammars and regular expressions, um, which, uh, which are more limited, which, uh, for example, can't simulate a Turing machine. But a Turing machine is one of these models of computation that can simulate anything that goes on here, although perhaps in a slow, clunky sort of way. Now, each of the system science methodologies is computationally universal, but each of them is sort of um, a, a finely suited to answer certain types of problems. And it turns out significant synergies, and I don't use this word lightly. It's not a matter of just adding to the value. It's, it's, there's kind of a whole grade on some of the parts here by using combinations of methodologies. Um, and uh, the reason for this is several fold, but um, the reasons for using hybrid methods are several fold. Uh, one of them is comparative advantage. There are times where aspects of the system, the presence of networks, the importance of delays, the, the presence of a workflow based system, pronounced features of feedback loops, et cetera, make it especially good fit, a very natural fit to some of these things. There's also times where in the course of a single model, there's very different types of processes that need to be represented. So the model, for example, RCA way built for COVID-19 early on, which has been used in Australia, which has been used in the Yukon Territory, used for day-to-day -day planning here in Saskatchewan for years. That, that model, uses discrete event simulation to, to characterize things like the contact tracing process and the testing process. 
but he uses agent-based modeling for simulating things like agent-agent -agent interactions uh, in a workplace or in a home, et cetera. And different areas of a model, different areas of, of a domain in the world often have different types of needs associated with them. And often we're drawn to hybrid modeling because when we simulate people going to the care system, we want to sweep event simulation. But when they're out in the population, maybe we make use of uh, system dynamics characterization or a uh, or an agency characterization. Another key need, though, reflects the fact that in modeling, we are learning. On the very first day of this class, I talked to you about the vision of dynamic models as providing not a crystal ball, which is a common misconception, but rather a learning prosthesis. And I analogize it there to a crutch or to an artificial leg, a cane. That's something that allows us to achieve full functionality despite our cognitive limitations. And as we're building a model, our learning is going on about what we need to represent in more detail. Sometimes we get stakeholder feedback. Sometimes the questions change brought to us by others. Sometimes it's just a matter of recognizing this area of the system because of sensitivity analysis, the video I asked you to watch, um, not necessarily for today, but because of sensitivity analysis, we discover the model's really sensitive to how we represent a certain area of it. And therefore, we want to represent it in more detail, more, more fine grained details. And so often, what we care about in the model, the boundary, what we go into more detail on changes. And we may want to make use of a more detailed representation, say, going from a system dynamics model, aggregate to an agent based model for an area of the system or going from an aggregate model of care, like you saw Thursday, people waiting for care and being treated to a discrete event. Another reason too is stakeholder resonance. It turns out that some stakeholders just really like and understand a certain type of representation. It just speaks to them, it's clear to them. They're the project sponsors. And they find it much easier to reason about this type of rep representation. For example, there are stakeholders in the world that find system dynamics aggregate representation very, very natural and straightforward. Demographers are among them. By contrast, you've got a physician, for example, they encounter the world through the lens of particular patients. They're not used to think about stocks of patients flowing. They think about individual encounters, people. And, and stakeholders sometimes nudge you towards one representation rather than another. There are representations that are more computational efficient. Mark my words. We have a modeling technique where one of the modeling techniques, one of the three we encounter, if you double the population size represented, it won't change the running time of that model at all. What the technique is that? System dynamics, yeah. In, in aggregate system dynamics, if you double the population size, right? It's just computing with bigger numbers, right? The stock holds a million instead of 500,000. It doesn't compute any slower with a million in there, right? Um, if you double the population of the agent based models, does it impact its performance? You bet it does. And normally at least doubles it. I say at least because there may be networks, for example, that mean that it actually goes up more than just by double because you may have particularly done snap works and, and more interaction between individuals or what have you. Um, so it turns out that different of these techniques have trade off computation. It's not always on the favor of. of of an aggregate model. It turns out agent based modeling, for example, is particularly effective at representing heterogeneity. If I have an agent based model and I add a distinction male versus female on the model, I want to keep track, you know, uh, in some dichotomous way of sex. Does that change the speed of the model appreciably? No, no, it doesn't really appreciably change it. It slightly increases the amount of space required by an agent, but it doesn't 
make it slower. In a system dynamics model, to capture an aggregate system dynamics model, to capture a set, turns out I need to stratify the model. I need to make a kind of a layer of the model for each set. Doubles the size of the model, but actually slows it down. So it means it has to do more work. And in general, if we get more, you may remember electrons I gave some time back, the more heterogeneity we give, the slower a stratified representation. And it does not really tend to slow down nearly as much on, a, on an age based model. So, age based models scale poorly for population size, well for heterogeneity. And the same thing uh, is true for discrete event simulation. But since my name is model scale poorly with heterogeneity, but well with population. Remember that. Um, and finally, we'll sometimes have within a given model a characterization that's at multiple levels. So maybe we want to characterize physiology within person, maybe to capture immune buildup, immune memory buildup from the decay, or physiology associated with diabetes, glucose insulin response. Or maybe I'm characterizing the my weight weight dynamics and body composition change uh, over time in a model. And we have that within an individual, and then we want to put those individuals in networks. We want to see if they're affected by other people, or we want to understand the dynamics of, uh, of uh, caregiver support for diabetes. Okay, so um, I'm going to going to talk about five compelling hybrid modeling patterns. And I, I want to be brief in my comments so we can get on to the systems data science discussion, to discussing the interface between system science on the one hand and data science on the other, and how the two can be combined very effectively. So, but before that, five compelling patterns for hybrid modeling. And we're going to go through most of these. With example. The first of them is service population interaction. Um, and I provided you a model many moons ago called multi clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects of lock in version, version 3, not 13. Three. And I'd like you to, to open that. I, you should have it. There from the from the uh, course site. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close these other models, and the boom, um, and go open that one myself. So I think you should find it. At, I think it's a little bit further up on the course site, and it'll take me a moment. Here we go. Multiclinic SAR. Here we go. Version three. Okay. There we go. Okay, now this model is extremely interesting. This is basically like an agent-based version of the last model we built. And I cannot resist showing you one feature that we didn't get time to talk about yet last time, but which is demonstrated in this model. And this is the effect of walking. Okay. Um, I had referred to it before. And so um if we go and we simulate the baseline in this model, well, let's let's go look at person. So here we have persons susceptible, exposed, and effective, and they recover, but only in a treatment-mediated way. If they require treatment to recover, and until then they spread infection, hence this, um, and they can transition to care. And when a person goes um, to seek care, for example, they'll get the nearest agent among the clinics in Maine, and they'll move to that clinic. And then at the clinic level, this person will walk in. I should have probably shown that, but I'll, I'll show it here when they arrive there. They'll walk into the clinic here, and at the clinic, they will, they will start flowing through here. If they wait too long, they will leave. Otherwise, they'll proceed on to treatment. And with a certain probability treatment will be successful, otherwise it'll be uh, failed treatment. 
with a certain probability of treatment success and they flow out and there's some number of healthcare workers here. So if we were to run this here um, up front, what we would see is uh, a spread of infection. And uh, I'm going to, uh, to, to take a look at a default baseline case here. Okay, and we'll go to the top level agent. We start with some agents infective here. And up front, up top rather, we'll see something about the illness count and uh, something about uh, the number of, of uh, uh, here the, um, I have to, you know, I have to check with this. So this is illness counts uh, here. I think one of them is is number of new infections, and one of them is is uh, pre-existing infections. In any case, uh, this may be utilization of chronic. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so here we go. We're we're simulating it, and the infection kind of spreads around at low levels in the population. Uh, the clinics, for example, here are 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 not currently overwhelmed uh, with only 17% utilization in the clinic so far. Uh, things are going on. Um, the infection is, is slowly spreading and it dies out. This is uh, a baseline case and the infection died out entirely. This is a stochastic model and uh, there's quite a possibility that it will die out. By contrast, in some simulations, the infection can go up to very, very high levels as it does here. And I wanna highlight the fact that um, having gone up to very high levels, um, this is, I guess, the number of times people have been infected, I'm guessing. And uh, this is the fraction of people that are infected right now, probably, and this is incidents. Wait, could you check that? Is that incidents? Number of new? Yeah, sure. Um, so here we have a single clinic uh, right now to which they are presenting. It's just, there's just uh, one, one clinic. That's why it's labeled one here. And you'll notice this clinic is totally maxed out at 94% of the population. Um, we're gonna go back to this, this main screen and I'm gonna add a clinic. I, I added uh, a second clinic here. Now we have two of them, whoops. Count of clinics, two and we'll continue to run it. And uh, that clinic will start to see an effect. Yes, wait. So the upper graph is like Utilization, and this is? Okay. So uh, we, added, we added a clinic. It brought down the prevalence a uh, little bit, um, but you'll notice the infection is still remaining at very, very, very high levels. I'll add in a third clinic, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pause it so that we can get it to, to do that quickly. And you'll notice with the third clinic, we yet further bring down uh, the, the uh, prevalence of infection, but it's not yet dying out by any means. It's uh, still a large fraction of the population. We have a total population of 1,200 and over 800 are, are currently ill. So that's about two thirds of the population. I just added a fourth clinic here, okay? Um, and uh, it's gonna take a bit of time to respond to that. Here we go. Now we're down to about 700 people out of the population being, being ill, but it's still not enough to make it, drive it to extinction. It's still remaining at a, a high level because people are not getting not getting treated quick enough. Um, we can go look at clinics, for example, here and see the level of utilization, but it's it's pretty clear it's it's uh, essentially maxed out if, if weight is correct, and this is utilization here, okay? Yeah, you can see it's about 99% there. Okay, so even with four clinics, we don't have, we don't have enough in the way of healthcare resources to, to make uh, uh, to make the the to fully control the infection in the population. Uh, going a little bit further uh, down to five. Now at five, we're seeing some real 
changes here, you'll notice it's around 400, which is about a third of the population, right? Uh, but it's it's quite variable. And uh, with time, it, it's possible it will go extinct. And lo and behold, finally, with five, we were able to, to conquer that. Now, the, the notable thing here is it took five clinics to get down to that level. If we ran the same model and we started it off here from the get-go with not just one clinic, I'm gonna pause it here. We have this one clinic to which people are presenting for care. They need care to get better, remember? And I'm going to add some more clinics. I add two and I'll, I'll say three clinics, okay? There we go. So we have a total of three clinics that, that people can go to. And we'll start it up and we'll find the infection tends to spread, but it tends to go extinct quite clo uh, closely. And in fact, as, as this comments here, uh, two clinics are normally enough to cause it to go extinct if you have them from the beginning. And you could go and, uh, for example, um, set up a scenario where every time you have two clinics and verify that very reliably with two clinics up front, you can drive this infection to extinction. It's a lock-in mode, right? It's a matter of if you go early on, get those resources in place, you can prevent it from getting in this adverse situation and do so with very modest resources. If you allow the situation to fester and, and reach very high levels, it takes much larger amounts of resources, two and a half, three times as many clinics, for example, to bring it down. A stitch in time saves nine, right? Um, intervening early saves you a lot of effort compared to intervening late. And this model illustrates that phenomenon, which is, it's also shown in that other model we were examining with the right exploration. But this is a hybrid model. What two types of modeling does this combine? Anyone? What two types of modeling are represented in this model? Yes, Tony. Uh, Discrete about Discrete about okay. Who are these? Who are these types of models? What is discrete event simulation used here for? How do we use it? Yes, the CLIN. We capture a structured workflow. This is a very simple one, but if you've got an interaction of, of nurses and physicians and availability of rooms and you know treatment uh, uh, treatment locations, uh, procedure rooms, or what have you, you can get much much more involved. But one of the nice advantages is here, we can add these resources in very easily, capture, in effect, that one resource is not the bottleneck, maybe it's another resource. Um, as often happens in these workflow-based systems, you know, doubling all resources is unnecessarily wasteful. It, it's often one resource that's the control. So this is an illustration of what I call service population interaction, or having a population coming in for treatment. And um, we've certainly used this in many, uh, many examples, particularly for diabetic end stage renal disease and, and used it for, for COVID, um, but used it as well for gestational diabetes, et cetera. So here we can answer joint questions about service type and the nature of the service and what's going on in the population, right? Um, Okay, I want to talk about another one though, one where we have an aggregate population. What sort of modeling type would I use for an aggregate population? What class? Hmm? System dynamics with an individuated, meaning we turn people into agents who are have reached a certain level of risk, reached a certain point in their development. We kind of zoom in for those who are who are of strongest interest. Okay, so it's kind of like we have a stocks and flows for the general population. We don't simulate everyone at individual level, 
But once they reach a certain point, maybe it's when they develop diabetes, or maybe it's when they are at risk. You could bring the strawberry back, place on it if you wanted to. We turn them into agents. They bud off into agents, and then they circulate as agents. We zoom in on them and follow them with particular care. We, we can follow their history. We can follow their characteristics. We can put them in networks and spatial, spatial context, et cetera. So here we can have tighter focus on the ABM, the ABM component. Um, it's lightweight simulation because most of the population is simulated at a very high level um, in an aggregate fashion. And we can account for experimentation. And critically, there's also a matter of opportunity cost. Um, in many circumstances, it really is not going to benefit us much by spending a lot of time creating agent based representation of the general population when we could use that time instead of over here. Opportunity cost is, it speaks about the fact that when we make one choice, say to focus on modifying representing the general population as agents, it means not pursuing another choice. It's the value of the opportunity for gone. So putting our efforts in here will take us away from our, our opportunity or our focus on it. And so here we can go light over here, not bear that opportunity cost, and put our efforts instead into representing the agent population. Okay, um, we can put it where, where it's most needed. Um, one of our models here guiding the province uh, made central use of this uh, technique um, within the opening months of the pandemic, one, um, uh, one created by my uh, student, uh, Yuan Tian. And she had a upstream system dynamics model. She had an agent model once people were infected she could have, we also discussed capturing them at the point where they're being contact traced at an agent level. And then they went into service delivery. Yuan has models of, that she's created for the Ministry of Health and, and Health Quality Council and the, the uh, health authority of each hospital in Saskatchewan. And she could represent uh, with discrete amount of simulation the patient flows and agents who needed care to flow into that model, although some were most recovered without needing that. And so here we have capacity planning guidelines for the province being based on this sort of tripartite model where we have system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation all at once. So um, the system dynamics here was stratified by age and sex and by risk factors such as um, chronic diseases. And, uh, and we would capture the impact on the flow on sort of service delivery, reflecting the fact people with certain chronic diseases are more likely to develop severe COVID. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at a model like that, okay? Um, and uh, the model is called budding hybrid SDABM. Now this is a particularly stylized model. I mean, it's it's austere um, and uh, very, very simple, but I think it will get the essential idea across. So it's called budding hybrid SDABM. So here we go. So we're gonna start with people in this general population stock. And when they go into this stock, they will be created as a, and how that happens is if this stock reaches above one, we go and create agents of the required count. So basically we get a count of agents to create based on the value of the stock. So if this stock is 2.3, we're gonna create two agents. We go through and we add those agents to the population. And from then on, we can follow them in detail. From then on, we can have them in family networks. We could have them interact with the healthcare system and keep track of their encounters with providers. We can have them intervened upon, et cetera. 
in a more realistic model, uh, such as what UN built, we might have this upstream component be stratified, meaning have it be, you know, so we distinguish people here, different sex, age group, and, and chronic condition, and then they'd be created with agents who have the character. But the point is, once they're created as agents, we can follow them in detail. We can intervene upon them in detail. We can remember their encounters with care system, and they can flow, as is the case here, into discrete event simulations, like we saw in the first hybrid model, where people went to the clinic. Okay? Simple idea. And again, big economies, because most of the population is represented as an aggregate model rather than as an individual model. But we can focus in on those we care most about. Okay. So we get the most, best of both worlds. It's not that we ignore the full population, we just characterize them at a higher level. You noticed my comment earlier this type of modeling, also, hybrid modeling, allows us to change the boundary. Maybe in UN's model, we, we would go and incorporate once individuals are contact traced, they become individuals. Once, once people are contact traced, they become individuals. They flow out of that, that general population and into an individual based representation so we can follow those from then on. Or maybe here, an at risk population or different stages of risk are captured at an individual level. So this is, allows us, as we learn, as we learn what's important to change this boundary. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the second compelling pattern for hybrid modeling. One that we've made heavy, of which we've made quite heavy use. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna take a look at um, system dynamics within agents for continuous dynamics of their internal state. Okay, so we're gonna close this one. And we're going to open one that's called something like CTL state variable use any logic set. And as I assured other one, ignore the historic reference to use any logic set. Okay. So here we have persons. And a given person here is characterized at first glance with a state chart that is a particularly particularly sort of simplistic view of, of life. The people are either living or dead. And what's notable is that in this model, they die based on a condition if they if their level of free variance exceeds a certain free viral threshold. Where is that free variance? Well, we see looking over a broader picture. Each person's internal state, and particularly their internal state with respect to infection, is characterized in this. What sort of model is this? You can say the free variance. This is my name. Yeah. So we have a stock of free variants. Um, so those are free virus particles circulating in the blood. X is the stock of uninfected cells, say, of the esophagus, uh, the epithelium of the throat. Y is infected cells, and cells can get infected along this axis. Now, what infects them is uh, the presence of free variants circulating with uninfected cells. So if uninfected cells make contact with these free virus particles, it will lead to infection and the spread of infection. But if that's all there was, we'd be in bad shape in the world. Instead, infected cells stir up an immune memory and an immune response in the form of Z here. And Z then helps in fighting infected cells by killing them. So these cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CTLs, kill off the infected cells. And uh, by so killing them off, those infected cells. Uh, aren't involved as much in virus production. Normally, those infected cells under the lysis is a they produce viruses. But if we kill them off with these immune-defending cells, CTLs, 
um, it'll prevent them from going in and then producing lots more virus. So the immune system here acts in a feedback system to attack the, the growing viruses within the body. Or spread or simulating here in such dynamics, infection spread. But infection spread not in the population, but in within a given person. Infected cell to infected cell. And it turns out that it can be extremely effective. We've done this for flu, for example, as, as well as some uh, uh, for some bacterial infections like uh, uh, like chlamydia, as well as uh, for for some more stylized infections. So we're going to run this, and we can put people here in networks, for example. Um, and you'll notice that we start with whoa, an individual infected early on. That's this person. And we set up the, the size of their visual representation, the size of this oval here. This was created in a very old version of any logic. So we do this a bit different back then. Um, this, uh, the size of this, of this oval was given by five times Z. In other words, the, the amount of, um, uh, the amount of uh, immune, immune strength or immune memory that's that's operating, immune activation, we'll say. That's the radius here. And uh, and then the color will be given by this, the free viral load. So we'll simulate this. And what we'll see is this infection is spreading to nearby ones. So you'll notice this one spread the infection. Why does it spread to others? It spreads because there's viruses from neighbors that are coming in from neighbors here, okay? From neighbors in the network. So these neighbors got infected and they start to, they start to respond. And in turn, their immune systems will come up. They reach a high level viral load, but then their immune systems start fighting it. And they, uh, the viral load level is, is lowered. And their immune system here remembers this virus for a long time. So it's slowly decaying. The amount of immune activation and immune memory by citizen is decaying only slowly. So they get over, the immune system helps them get over this initial first of viruses. And then it remembers it, but the infection is spreading to others in the population. A simple idea. But it turns out one that can be very insightful for certain types of questions. For example, here, we could ask about how is, how is the spread of infection affected by individuals who have lower immune system strength? That's lower C. Yeah. Their immune system isn't reacting that strongly. Or we could simulate the effects of a drug being administered to people, an antiviral drug. We can simulate the effects on a person of early hospitalization and, and quarantining them. Low immune strength will, will impact the duration of infection, will impact the severity with which it goes, and the chance that they'll die. And we can capture all that very nimbly within a model such as this. We can capture the fact a uh, high risk of fatality for individuals with, for example, low, low immunocompetence. No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to debug all, oh, man. Don't get me into the debug. Um, uh, cancel. Um, so we're going to now change the threshold for, for um, this uh, infection to be, to be fatal. So here we're going to get people, and people are going to be infected but some of them will have lower immune strength and may lead to a situation where the viral load reaches such a level they die and will remove them from the network and prevent them from passing on the infection as fully as they would have originally. So here, the individual's internal evolution is given by their heterogeneity, their characteristics. And we can examine things like Immune, uh, like uh, immunization or vaccination, how that affects immune strength. 
We can examine antiviral drugs. We can examine treatment regimens. And for diseases like HIV AIDS or like COVID-19, this is a strong one. So here we have a type of modeling that leverages, what two types of modeling are leveraged with that? Anyone? What type, types of modeling is that used? Yeah, agent-based and system dynamics. Where is the system dynamics used? Exactly, exactly. Agents situation is driven by system dynamics, yeah. All right. Um, and system dynamics is great for allowing us to represent kind of theory-based dynamics. Um, there's a lot of models out there that are based on differential equations to be characterized with system dynamics models, with stocks and stuff. Um, but we can capture their networks, their spatial context using these sort of models. And, and you can mix together a continuous representation like we saw at an individual level with the stocks and flows with a discrete one such as involving death, right? They can disappear when they, when they die. Um, and, uh, and be removed from the population. So we can capture this kind of hybrid between continuous dynamics and discrete dynamics. Dynamics where they exist or they don't, for example. Um, I haven't provided you, actually, I think I, I did, I may have provided you with this one. I was thinking about building this with you today or uh, something like this, with, or where it's an environmental contamination scenario. Um, and uh, you have for different environments, I think we actually did see this uh, earlier. So I'll, I'll just go call it up here. And here we have, for example, persons, and the persons go in a shedding, and they're shedding into homes, which have a pathogen reservoir, and workplaces, which have a pathogen reservoir, and thereby they spread the infection, build up pathogen at work, can infect other people. And here we have dynamics of infection, say, on surfaces or in air in the air for aerosol in different workplaces. This is another form of combination of system dynamics driving agent evolution here, agent evolution at the workplace and home level, the processes of buildup and decay of, of, of pathogen on surfaces together with agents and agents that move between these environments over time, um, going, going to work and, and coming back home. Um, you can you can do similar things with, for example, mosquito populations or bird populations and West Nile virus uh, here in Saskatchewan. Um, okay, just proceeding on. Uh, another one is agents drive aggregate system dynamics. So here we have an agent, but they're driving some high level continuous uh, variables. So um, well, we might for example, total up the costs across the population or the amount of time required across the population for treating people. So here we're gonna open up one of the models I provided you and it's called basic health economics, uh, any logic seven, version two. We're gonna open that up and we'll see the basic idea is simple here. We have individuals, the individuals progress among a bunch of states. And then we have at the overall level, some accumulation of costs, for example. These are accumulated undiscounted costs. These are discounted costs. These are quality adjusted life years and life years lived. And these accumulate according to how many people are in the population with with what situation. So for example, we have a number of cumulative quality of life across the population at a given time, which is given by population statistic. 
And this just adds up across the entire population here. Here we go. Um, it adds up uh, the quality of life measures uh, at an individual level. And then we have people and each, each of these states is associated with a sort of a certain quality of life. And basically this model can total up at an aggregate level across the entire population, the quality of life. And this gives the measure called quality of life. We can do a similar thing with the total population, totaling up the life years lived by the population, where on a per year basis, the number of new life years lived is just the population size. So if it's a thousand people for one year, we say there are a thousand life years lived in that year. If it's a hundred people for 10 years, we say it's a thousand life years lived. If it's 2,000 people for half a year, we'd say it's a thousand life years. And so we total that up across the population. Here we're accumulating at this higher level. Okay. Um, now, this is a particular simple idea, but you could imagine in other contexts, for example, totaling up where we might have agents population, say that a company, and these companies are maybe trying to sell tobacco to people or vaping products, or they're trying to, they're trying to promote certain types of, of, uh, of, of use of their, of their pharmaceuticals or products. And we might have a high level model like the stock and flow model where that's driving the flows. Okay, um, simple idea. And then finally, uh, aggregate system dynamics driving agent population. Here we might have, say, mosquito population in the province of infected mosquitoes. This is for West Nile virus leading to agents to be infected that are representing humans. So here we might represent mosquitoes um, uh, and birds only in stock and flow fashion. Um, you know, you can only imagine the computational uh, burden that would be imposed if you tried to simulate all mosquitoes in Saskatchewan in the summer I mean, at an individual level, right? Um, there are, believe it or not, there are agent based models of mosquitoes and mosquito dynamics and, and interactions, behaviors, and egg life. I've met modelers who, who like focus on malaria and they have. Individual level agent agent by characterization of mosquito flight and trying to trying to bite people, but encountering bed nets and trying to go lay eggs by the water margin. It's it's quite quite something. But here we might be much more parsimonious in our representation by having stocks and flows at an aggregate level of mosquito population and bird population, not shown here. And have infected mosquitoes fighting the unfortunate people, right? Um, and and potentially delivering West Nile uh, virus to them. Um, okay, okay. Um, so what I've just provided is is five compelling health hybrid modeling patterns, but patterns that carry over the many areas which allow us to mix together different combinations of discrete event simulation, agent-based modeling, and system dynamics modeling. Taking advantage of the unique features of these, the fact that we have accumulations of feedbacks going on within our bodies and while we're governing disease and involving buildup of, of pathogen on surfaces, et cetera. Uh, on the one hand, but we may have services that just beg for representation with this event simulation. We have interactions between agents and different environments and in the population, which, which practically militate for agent-based representation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the ability to weave these together that offers such value. And if you're wondering why we make use of any logic, it's this ability to really link them together the perhaps it's the asset. And going forward, much of modeling success, much of modeling opportunity and promise lies in the ability to weave these together intelligently. 
It's a matter, ladies and gentlemen, of metalinguistic abstract. Choosing the right abstract, the right language. Dr. Flow, state charts and agents and networks or discrete event simulation workflows for the job. It's about choosing which tool set is best in which area of the model and weaving them together. And there are very few people worldwide who learn all three things. In your own so bear that in mind. Traditionally, people have been tooled in one technique or another, and it, it limits models. In some cases, it impoverishes models. And, and it's really by weaving these together that great things can often be achieved that would otherwise be difficult. So those are my comments and uh in brief on hybrid.